Okay, so hi everybody. Um, as I said, uh, I'm Nina Mani. I'm actually calling in from the Adelaide Plains, which is the traditional lands of the Ghana people. And um, I thank the organisers of the Oscope conference for giving me the opportunity to present this there. And I wanted to share with you something that was a little bit out of the box of what we normally talk about when we give, say, a straight down the line science presentation. And I want to talk a little bit about how we do our science and who we are in doing it. Let me just start off by saying how awesome we are. We understand our planet better than anyone else at any previous time. We hold the key for our future resource needs and their impacts. We can harness our technology to measure and observe the Earth in ways that we've never done before. And also we provide valuable and important science for the future of our existence. Absolutely awesome, fantastic stuff. But why doesn't everybody seem to know about this? Are they not listening or do they not understand what we're saying and, and just how awesome we are? What do we do? Well, we, can we bang on the desk and tell them more about it? Maybe, maybe if we just keep telling them and tell them louder, they'll finally understand. But then what do we tell them? How do we tell them? And really, let's ask ourselves, why would they want to listen? And this talk is then going to really think about and, and discuss some of those key issues. It's got three main parts, and that is we're going to look briefly at who we are. Then can we be trusted? And then what are we going to do about it? So let's first of all have a look at who we are. We come by lots of different names, some of which I would be um, I would be too ashamed and, and blush too much if I were to repeat here. But um, as far as our science goes, we come by names such as geologists, geophysicists, geographers, earth scientists, geoscientists, geodesists, a whole myriad of specialist titles that uh, is almost an endless list. What I actually prefer, and this is very much aligned with where I work at Geoscience Australia, is the broad and inclusive term geoscience and how that takes in and embraces geology, geography, and really the very broad science of the earth. Funny thing is that even if we tend to define ourselves by what we personally know or experience, our field is bigger than what we may have learned at uni, what we may know ourselves. And I think that's a really important thing to remember because I think a lot of us like to define the field that we're part of by what we feel that we are experts in or that we've been trained in or that we know very well. But I think we can also sometimes importantly step back and be a little more humble and realise that perhaps our field is a lot bigger than even what we may have been exposed to and may know. Which then raises the question is, as scientists in our field, are we as inclusive? If, as we should be. And I think it's really quick to sort of think, oh yeah, yeah, we're a pretty good bunch. We'll, we'll let anyone in, we're really inclusive. But we often get bogged down debating and wondering whether they are really part of us or are they one of us? A really good example has been a lot of those discussions about that really broad definition of geoscience and, and whether um, areas branching into surveying geodesy, geography, how well they really do align with us. And I believe they do. One thing that's important about who we are is to think about what brings us together. And one of the really valuable things where they're used well is that many places, organisations have a mission or a vision or even a strategy. The challenge is that many places that even have these don't always use them. So it's important that if we do have them, that they're actually worthwhile, that they're measured against or even acknowledged in our work. And I just want to remind everyone of a definition of strategy that our CEO, James Johnson, often reminds me and other staff of, is that strategy is about the behaviour and action towards an objective. So it's not just a document that sits on the shelf or in the cupboard. It's about how we do and behave towards what we are actually all about. At Geoscience Australia, we also have key uh, mission and vision statements. Our mission is the trusted source of information on Australia's geology and geography for government, industry, community decision making, but also that vision of a safer and more prosperous and well-informed Australia. And that's part of our 
key strategy at Geoscience Australia, which we call Strategy 2028, because it's a decadal strategy. And that's recently been supported just in the last week by the release of Geoscience Australia's first science strategy. And I have a YouTube link there if you want to see a, re a recent presentation that I gave with James Johnson on the release of that strategy. The other challenge that we have is that it's not just the subject matter of our science that creates diversity for us. It's about where we are working or who we work for or what we align with. And we have our, our geoscientists working in industry, government, research and teaching. And if you think it's pretty easy just to honour all of those things and throw them in together, just think about the challenges even at universities where the academics are trying to balance things like research and teaching as part of their career development and time development. And I think it applies to really all of those areas, some of those challenges of balancing out those different value propositions that we have and also the different measures of success. And I think recognising that's not only key to ourselves, but key for how we work with other geoscientists. Thinking about what are each of our aspirations and matters of concern but also what we share, what are the commonalities between each of us as scientists. So that's a little bit about who we are. What I want to now talk about is trust. Trust is really fundamental to our science and how it's valued. And I'll just explain a little bit about why that is. So what is trust? Well, it's not just a nice touchy-feely thing to have. It's actually linked inherently to our credibility, particularly as scientists, but also as people. And that link, that credibility links to integrity, intent, our capability, and our track record of results. The other thing about trust is that it's scalar. It ranges between self-trust, which is really important, trust yourself, how you work and what you stand for, but also relationship trust, organizational trust, the next scale there I've struggled with wording, I've called it market or reputational trust. It really is the trust that we have within our field and amongst our um, wider colleagues. And then the last one, there's societal trust, really important. So when we work and are aligned with people that we trust, we can get more done. So anyone who's had the pleasure of working in a workplace where you feel that would know what I'm talking about. Similarly, I think some people find that the frustrations that they get with their workplace come from the fact that they're not aligned and trusting of the people that they work with. The really key one for all of us to think about is societal trust. And the important thing there is that that societal trust increases when we create value, particularly in our science for others and, and also society. When we give something back, and that's often referred to as public value. Trust that we try to generate is also not conditionally transactional. And I really want to just stress that and explain a little more. A really a real classic example of where that breaks down is where you hear from perhaps people that work with mining companies and they say, I don't understand why the town won't let us build a mine on their borders. We've just funded them to have these amazing tennis courts and they still won't let us go ahead with the mine. And that's an example of where conditional transactional trust um, is actually not relevant. And then the other important thing to think about is that we tend to judge our own level of trust by our intentions. We often talk about, well, I intend to do this. I'm, my ambition is to be like this. But the funny thing is to remember that we actually assess others by their actions. This person did this, so therefore my trust in them is such and such. A really good example of trust and how we perhaps struggle with it a little bit, and this is very relevant to our science, is this diagram, which I've actually um, found from sort of Simon Sinek's work. Simon Sinek's a very um, famous and popular kind of self-help person. You can see a lot of his work online. Um, and this is a, a talk that he gives that you can very easily find uh, in a whole lot of different places online on YouTube, um, where he talks about the importance of trust and how it links to performance and who we might want to recruit. The example he uses in his talks is about the US Navy SEALs and how they get what he calls the best of the best of the best. Um, what 
he points out is that we all want to employ people that are high performance and high trust. That's a bit of a no-brainer. Of course, we want people like that, but they're not that easy to find. The other thing that's obvious is that we don't want to employ people that are of low performance and low trust. So given that, if we can't get always people with high performance, high trust, where else do we go to for our recruitment and the people that we want to work with? Well, one thing that's really sure on this is that this area of high performance, low trust is really problematic. And um, Cynic refers to these people as the toxic people in the organisation. And um, the example he gives is that everybody typically knows who they are. All you have to do is go around the workplace and ask who's the a-hole in the, in the workplace. And it's usually this high performing, low trust person. And one of the problems is, is that we so very easily measure performance by money brought in, research outcomes, um, status, publication, citation, all of these different measures, but we're not very good at measuring trust. What Cynic actually points out, and I really find this fascinating, is that the next best place to go to after high performance, high trust, is instead into this area of medium performance and high trust. And in some circumstances, depending on the workplace and the role, even perhaps the low performance, high trust. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to think about, particularly when we look across our geoscience community. And a little bit more on trust, I think really highlights some of the challenges that we're facing right now. And that is that as scientists, we, we really should remember that we have personally invested a lot in our skill, knowledge and experience. We've gone to university, we've usually done further study, a lot of work um, choices and hard, hard decisions made that really invest in us as scientists. So much so that in many cases, a measure of our success or the outcome is how we can sustain and maintain our expertise and status that we've invested in. And a really good article, if you haven't read it, is uh, an article about the hero model by uh, Lindy Elkins Tanton. Great article talking about how we really invest a lot in these heroes of our science. One of the challenges with this approach is that this can make embracing or leading change and disruption difficult. I certainly find that a big challenge and I found that a big challenge as I came into my current role. And that was the balance between being a credible disruptor that we all want to be in many ways when we bring about and lead change, as opposed to the marginal maverick that might feel that they have the solution, but are unable to express it and put it across in a way that has everybody following and on side with it. As a result of this, we therefore risk becoming entrenched or institutionalized in our science. The notion of trying different things, working in different ways, working in different areas can actually become quite intimidating and frightening to us because of this, um, this institutionalized or um, sort of locked in to our investment approach. And what it also means is that we have a tendency to communicate with the community about matters of fact that highlight our investment strengths. We love to show people that we are knowledgeable and that we've invested a lot in it and that they should trust us because we know all the facts. The problem we have though, is that this often comes at the expense of firstly listening to the community or the, the government or the people that we want to try to help. And most importantly, addressing their matters of concern rather than the matter of matters of fact that we might be trying to tell them. These people with their matters of concern are often worried about things like lifestyle, employment, uh, environment of where they live and so forth in a very um, broad and general sense, rather than the facts of the stratigraphy or geological evolution or the scientific measurement data that we may otherwise be able to tell them. And it's a really important thing for us to think about. Now to just wrap up, I then don't want to just leave you with those challenges and problems. I actually want to share a little bit about perhaps some things that we can do about this. I've got three main things that I want to just talk about today. It's not the only things that we can do, but just three that I want to highlight here. The first one is the importance of listening and learning. 
many of the challenges that we face in geoscience are not completely new. There'll be new aspects of them or new combinations, but they're not completely new. And we can learn a lot from what has gone before. Really good examples are at the moment, there's a lot of challenge around university and geoscience departments at universities closing. But it's interesting to look back to the early 2000s and an excellent uh, report produced by the Mineral Council of Australia called Back from the Brink actually touches on a lot of the issues that still operate today. It's a little different, but there's still some key learnings from that. Another example is improving the quality or the discovery of quality mineral resources and even energy resources within and through the cover. And a really good point there is that although some of it may be a bit outdated now, there's a lot of great material, great approaches and great insights to be found in the Amira sponsored Uncover Roadmap and particularly the appendices that go with that. And so let's not devalue or write off these things from the past. There's still a lot to learn from them. So value and trust, listen before you speak. I think it's a really important bit of advice. And I'll give you one example a little more specifically around the university geoscience closures because a lot of people are, are very concerned about this and there's been a lot written and said about it. Um, I just want to share one thing that I perhaps haven't heard so much about and they were five things that, that I saw that were learned from previous university geoscience closures. Number one, was that team trust and alignment that extends to market and societal trust was absolutely important. So that is a team of say academics at the university that are aligned, that work together and also extend that alignment out into building market and societal trust, perhaps within industry, government or more widely within their science. Secondly, having a clear mission and vision supported by strategy capability and measurable KPIs. We've got a lot of amazingly good geoscience departments in this country, and it would be a shame to see them close down. But one thing that perhaps we can articulate better is what the capabilities of these departments are, and perhaps ensuring that they do have a strong strategy, mission and vision that they use and measure against. A lot of departments that have been closed down by universities have been closed down without a strong record of perhaps what KPIs or measurables could have been achieved to avoid closure. So these things are important. The third one is having a dynamic and engaging team teaching program. Okay, they, one of the key things that's led to closures is about graduations and student numbers. So therefore the teaching programs are very important, um, particularly at first year level. And really important there is having a supportive degree structure that allows students to choose geoscience courses, which are often a latter choice out of what they do in first year. And ensuring that the research programs that they're involved with are also really relevant to particularly to society. Fourth one is about course rationalization and broad geoscience perspective can make a difference for generating critical mass and community. So rather than looking at cutting our expertise off from other areas of expertise or other departments around the country or parts of industry and government. It's actually about collaboration and pulling these things together and that increases the critical mass of who we have and, and then also potentially the critical mass of students that graduate. And then lastly, diversity. Diversity supporting the adoption, uh, sorry, supporting adaptation which supports resilience. So by having people that are working on different areas of geoscience will have their peaks and troughs that hopefully balance each other out so that we don't see overinvestment in one area. And if that has a trough, then the whole department is endangered. So diverse research and also diverse teaching staff. Diverse teaching staff is important, particularly to um, connect our subject matter with a diverse range of students in the courses. The second thing about what we can do about it is finding the big science questions and opportunities that make a difference and bring us together. I'm not bragging and, and saying that we have all the answers at Geoscience Australia, but I will share that we're very, very conscious of this with our strategy 2028 at Geoscience Australia. And we have six key impact, um, impact streams that we feel address some of those big questions and challenges in our science. 
perhaps when we look a bit more into geoscience across our country, I can think of three things that really come to mind that are important. First one I've got here is our data, developing and ensuring that we aspire to fair data principles but particularly thinking about not just doing it because it's right, which it is, but actually looking at the advantages and why doing that is actually in all of our interests. And some of those things are around the value of having quantitative rather than only observational qualitative data, data that we can test and measure against, but also the suitability of this sort of data for uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And one aspiration that really excites me is that we're seeing a lot of interest in developing digital twins, particularly in urban type uh, infrastructure settings. But what about also starting to aspire towards developing a digital twin of our geoscience data for our continent and adjacent offshore areas? I know that's not going to happen overnight, what an amazing aspiration that would be and something that we could work towards. Second one I've got there is about resource exploration, data and discovery, and really ensuring that we talk about the value for society of that. It's not just about holes in the ground and mines, it's actually really about ensuring that we have the resources to sustain our society into the future. When we think about it, there's some things that I always find interesting about what we may be missing. We're very obsessed with the known mineral deposit styles or mineral systems we talk about, um, but how open are we to finding new styles of mineralization and resources and new settings? I wonder what we miss because we're just simply not looking for it. I think Tim Krask from Western Australia talks about these things in geoscience and how um, they link to the idea of black swans. How would we find a black swan mineral system? And, and, and also that point that it's not about just new ore bodies, it's about new mines with new quality resources for a sustainable and progressive lifestyle. And the last point there is really about the big question around environmental and landscape change. This is, we know that this is a big issue and it will only get bigger. But the, some of the questions that we need to struggle or need to, to help with in our science is about, is it real and why does it matter? And I think there's lots of opportunities in what we're doing in Australia, working towards um, the space industry, the great work that we and potential that we have for incorporating better positioning data, uh, particularly over time into our science and feeding into a better earth system understanding. And then the last bit, the last thing that I think that we can do is really looking at how we do our science not just what we do, not just what we deliver, but how we do it. This is why at Geoscience Australia, we have now launched a um, science strategy that really builds on the six strategic science principles of relevant science, collaborative science, quality science, transparent science, communicated science, and sust sustained science capability. As I said earlier, if you wanna know more about that, there's a link there to a talk where James Johnson and I outline this science strategy. But thinking nationally, what is our national geoscience capability and capacity? How do we collaborate? Do we do it well? I think another really important thing is around how we access land, air and sea to collect our data. That's a key interaction between us and the community, how we manage our data and how we then inform our community, nation and the world, particularly of the value and then the trust that goes with that data. And lastly, the question I want to leave us all with is, do we bring our best person to our science and is it safe to do so? And will it be respected if we do? I think a really important thing to, for us to think about as the people that we are that are doing the science beyond just the science that we do. Thank you for that. That's um, all from me for today. <laughs>